Hello, I'm Christine Porter and I'd like to welcome you into my home and my garden. I may have met some of you because I've travelled all around the world. I've been lucky enough to be teaching patchwork and quilting in many, many countries. I judge and I lecture, mostly in the United States and Great Britain, but I've also been to New Zealand, Canada and several countries in Europe and I'm still travelling. So I thought it would be really nice to make this DVD because many of my students say to me, how do you choose your colours? What do you do when you go into a quilt shop? And what inspires you to make the quilts that you make? Well, I'm sitting here at the moment, surrounded by some of the quilts from my new book. I've just written this book, and it's actually being launched today. I'm really proud of it, and I've had great fun making over 40 quilts for this book. So we've had quite a lot of opportunity to choose fabrics, and I've got some here. I think really that the fabric makes the quilt. I just love choosing the colours and being sometimes quite outrageous. So what I thought we'd do here is to look at my studio and see how I operate and what I've got there. I'm very lucky because I have a room at the top of the house which has windows at both ends. And then I thought we would go and look for some sources of inspiration in my city in Bristol. And then we'd come back and I would draft some designs. And once we've got some designs done, we're going to go shopping. We're going to go to a quilt shop in London and we're going to choose some fabric and then come home and we're going to make the blocks. And then you'll see a quilt. You'll see many quilts because we've got a lovely gallery at the end too, with lots of quilts there. I've also designed some patterns which are being sold by Joan Wolfram Designs Publishing Company and there are more um, coming as well. So life is really very exciting and I'm enjoying creating and de developing my creativity and there'll be further books coming soon. So let's go and start by looking at my studio. I'd like to welcome you to my sewing studio. I'm fortunate enough to have a whole room devoted to my sewing. I think sometimes we are just left with a bedroom or something like this, but uh, luckily this room is long and it has light at both ends and that's really very helpful for me. My equipment here, I have um, my sewing machine and I like it set in this table because it gives me a flat area to, to sew on. Um, I also have an extra light in case I need it. And then storing my fabric, I've got a basket system here and I store it in um, colour coordinated. So for example, if I look in here, I've got my reds and orange all graded in. At least I know where they are. They may not always be uh, tidy. Um, and the yellows and here, and then I go on to brown. With some of my projects, when I buy fabric, I actually keep it all together in um, a storage packet so that I know that that's the project I want to work on. For example, I've got one here, which is a current um, project I'm working on. And so I've stored it. It's very useful having these zipped bags. So all the fabrics that I wanted to keep together to go in this particular quilt are kept here. So then I don't lose them in amongst all of this. So that's one way of, of storing your fabric. I like to keep um, dots together, stripes together, checks together, and then I have um, a lot of batiks uh, in here too. And then what I call my fun fantasy fabrics are in here. Sometimes I go wild and buy bits of fabric and I'm never sure what I'm going to do with them. Sometimes they go on the back of the quilt and sometimes I might put them on the front, but they're kind of wild ones. Like this, for example. Cowgirls in the snow. There. Don't often use fabric like that, but it's quite nice to, to have some. This system um, I built myself and uh, I got the baskets from Ikea and then um, I got my husband to build a formica top which sadly soon got covered up. I'm going to show you a bit more about thread now and also um, my design wall which is a very important part of my sewing room. 
We'll be looking at my cutting table later on when we're doing drafting of our blocks that we're, we're choosing to do. I also have an iron um, and an ironing board and I don't have it next to my sewing machine because it makes me get up and walk because I think sometimes if we're sewing all day you can actually get very stiff and it's not good for you. So doing having a bit of exercise, walking to the ironing board is a really good thing. So let's go and look at the threads. I like to store my thread in easy places to find them and I've, I bought these storage units in a big DIY chain and they're really handy because I can just pull them out and put the thread in. And for example, they're all colour coded. So this is the orange thread and then below would be yellow and above would be red. So I know exactly if I want to choose a colour then I've got my um, choice here. I also have um, other storage units which are really nice because you can have a wide range with different shades uh, of colour and I like using these when I'm embellishing my quilts and also when I'm quilting and I want to match the thread to the colour of the fabric. I quite like to do that sometimes because when the patterns are quite complex you don't want the colour of the thread to jar from the design of the quilt. I have a television here because I like to watch the television sometimes when I'm sewing and also when my grandchildren come and they like to help me sewing uh, but sometimes they watch a DVD and it's quite nice to have them here. We're making quilts together too and that is really good fun. So I'd like to show you my design wall now and this is made with um, a backing of a foam core board which I bought at an art supplier's which I've attached to the wall with velcro, double sided velcro and then I've covered it with um, a big piece of warm and natural batting or wadding. You could use any um, cotton batting, polyester doesn't work but when you use something like this the fabric then just sticks to it so you can see if I just take that down and then if I want just to put a, some blocks up or something I can do that. So that makes a handy reference point. This is the biggest piece of wall I have in this room but so when I make bigger quilts obviously they aren't going to fit on the wall. The design wall is a handy space to put, actually just put things on the wall as reference and this is a resource photo I took of some tiles in um, Beverly Minster in Hull and then this is the uh, quilt part of the quilt that I made uh, resembling the tumbling blocks and then if I buy other things you know a little pattern or you know a design I think I want to do then I just pin that on the wall and then I don't forget it. And now we're going to look at the mat that I use um, for my chair in front of the sewing machine. This is a special secretarial mat which has little things on it which stick into the carpet and I find it really useful because I can move my chair around very easily on here without hurting my back. I find that if I don't use it and then the chair digs in and it actually hurts my back when I'm going backwards. This way when I sit in front of the sewing machine I can sit exactly square on to the needle which is the best place to be and then I can see anything I want for stitches here. The sewing machine I use is a Husqvarna Viking Designer SE. There's such a wide range of sewing machines on the market today. I like this particular one because it has a sensor system. You don't have to have a lever at the back and when you put your foot on the foot or the pedal it just starts immediately. It also has a lot of um, alternative stitches that you can use here and it has a button which um, just cuts thread so you've really not much need for scissors. If you want to know more about other sewing machines there's a very good DVD produced by Traplet with Wendy Gardner called Sew Easy a guide to sewing machines. So here's my ironing board looks like an ordinary ironing board but actually it has um, a vent system in it so when you sp press the steam button the steam goes right through the fabric and it doesn't come back at it and I like that system. I buy these um, 
tops in the market actually and then I just wash them they go in the washing machine I when I um, press my fabric I tend to just use some spray starch you can get sizing as well but I just use um, any cheap kind of starch and I press from the back side and I just mist it I shake the tin and just gently mist it so it's not a lot and then with the iron I just go over it and then that gets rid of any creases and it also makes the fabric slightly stiffer which um, makes for accuracy when you're cutting. I like this particular iron because it has a steam tank uh, which saves going up and down stairs getting lots of water to fill the little um, jug so this is very very handy up here. I'm going to show you just a little bit more fabric now. When I store the, the fabric I've got the spots up here and the checks and I've added some stars here and the stripy fabric and what I wanted to demonstrate was using stripe fabric as a binding as we will show in the gallery that if you cut fabric on the bias you get a nice barber pole effect for the binding it's quite handy too if you can actually find fabric which is printed with the stripes going diagonally because then you don't have to cut on the bias because it's already going like that. So I look out for fabric like this from time to time and add it to my collection. I treat my collection like an artist's palette because you never know when you might want that particular colour. The other fabric I tend to collect a lot of now, I've got four grandchildren, is this kind of thing. They love animals and tractors. I have pigs and cows and of course ballet dancers. So that's fun to collect. So we've had a look around my studio, we've looked at the fabric the threads, the sewing machine, the design wall and the iron and we'll look at the cutting table where I do the drafting a little bit later but why don't we go and look for some sources of inspiration let's go outside and see what we can find. Inspiration, where does it come from? Well we've got things all around us that inspire us it could be from all manner of things, where we live, what our climate is like and magazines and books. So I'm going to show you a few of the things that inspire me and I hope that they can help you. First of all, we've got quilting magazines. They're available very readily now and they come from all over the world. This is obviously British, New Zealand, America. There are Australian ones and many more British magazines too. So you can look at those and get ideas for projects and um, read articles about what's going on in your country and what's going on in other countries and you may find something there to inspire you. Or you could look at quilt books. I have several, I can't resist some of these. I quite like ones that have traditional blocks in and I like to see about the history of quilting or read about the history of quilting and to look at what people did years and years ago. And then more up-to-date books this one is called The Block Party by Marsha McCluskey and it shows you several blocks and that's really inspirational because you get to see the light, medium and dark values of the fabric so you can see how putting fabric in a different place might, might alter it. This is a lovely book and I often look to it for inspiration and these are very traditional blocks. There can be other books that are more contemporary thinking outside the block or quilt making and then these are very good these two for basic technique you might want to know about machine quilting or looking once again at quilts that pioneer people made and there's one particular one in here that I want to show you because this is one of the blocks that we're going to talk about and that we're going to make so this is an antique quilt and it's very similar 
to this antique quilt that I bought on my last visit to the States. Even the colours are similar and this is this nice block with flying geese units around the side that create a nice star pattern. Another thing that inspires us is travel. We go on holidays. It's so easy now to fly anywhere we like. And uh, so take your camera with you. I love using my camera for um, my quilting. And here are a couple of photographs that I took um, that inspired me. This is from Guatemala. And these are hammocks that were hanging up in a market. And this is some really colourful pictures of a boat in Mevagissi Harbour in Cornwall. Fabulous colours that you could make into a quilt there. So let's look at some of the quilts and see what inspired me. We've already looked at this antique quilt. It could be that the seasons inspire you. This is a quilt I made that was really inspired by some autumn leaves that were falling outside our house. We had a big um, Virginia creeper and as the autumn went on the colours changed and I picked up all the leaves and went to my stash of fabric and matched them up and this is the little quilt that I made and then I put the um, leaves there with a um, reverse applique and I just quilted these lines, squiggly lines, to look as though the uh, wind was blowing the leaves around. Another thing that inspires me, and here we are sitting in the garden, are flowers. I just adore gardening and uh, some of the beautiful flowers that you can grow. Some of my favourites are irises. I just love iris. They come in so many different colours and shapes and so I was inspired recently to make a quilt with irises on in applique onto pieced background. Something else that inspires us is fabric. How can you resist it? I saw this in a box and I just had to buy the box. All the colours of the rainbow are in here and more besides and I know that this will inspire me to make a really colourful quilt. Super colours here. Another thing that can inspire you is going to an art exhibition and I saw one on kimonos. This was from an art exhibition and it's part of a kimono with the waves on and that is a picture of the whole kimono and so I decided to make a little quilt made with um, a kimono block. Here are a couple of the blocks I use Japanese fabric for this. That's another good reason to buy fabric, isn't it? Just make your stash bigger. It makes a collection. And here's a quilt I made based on the kimonos. It's the tea block. Once again, that was from a collection of um, Japanese fabric. Other things that can inspire us are birthday cards. And when I saw this card of poppies, I just knew with the light and the colour and all the different shades of green that I wanted to make a quilt. All the values are here from light to medium to dark and that gives you the contrast that you want to make a really good quilt. So I just had to make one inspired by these very pretty poppies. And lastly, here's a lovely little piece of um, tumbling blocks patchwork that I found which is a real antique. So we've seen all kinds of inspiration travel photographs, magazines, books, a piece of antique sewing or an antique quilt, flowers, going to exhibitions, looking at cards, but don't forget to go to quilt shows too because sometimes you can look at literally hundreds of quilts and be inspired and classes too are a very good way of finding more inspiration. But we also want to go outside and look at other sources of inspiration that are in our cities and towns around us. So let's go and find something else. Here we are in Bristol Cathedral. It's got the most wonderful floor here. I love coming here. It's one of my favourite places. 
Um, if you like geometric designs as I do, then this is a feast for the eyes. It really is stunning. There are so many patterns here. We're going to start with something really simple. Uh, so we're just going to look down here by the choir stalls and here you will see some zigzag designs. When I go to quilt shows I always look at the uh, borders of quilts to see if people use this design and they rarely do and it's such a simple one but really effective. So let's just look at the floor and see what we've got here. There are some zigzags here and this one is reflected on the outer side in pink marble, pink and grey marble, uh, same here. And then there's a sort of brown, uh, black, grey marble here. And then inside is a square within a square. Quite a simple design. These are alternate, yellow, white, yellow and white. And this is really nice, easy design to make. It's got set in triangles here and then a nice border. I made a quilt that's almost exactly the same. I try to buy a fabric that looks like the tiles. Sometimes I make it, sometimes I don't. But I think it will, I'll show you the quilt and you'll see what you think. I made this one life size and um, you can see it pretty well fits. It's very effective, and although the design was laid in 1910, I think that the quilt looks really contemporary and would hang very nicely in any modern building today. When you're photographing in churches, it's always a good idea to get permission to photograph. Most people are quite happy to let you do that, but if not, then it's a good idea to take a sketchbook with you, which is what I do sometimes. It's nice to take a picture of the outside too as a record shot. We're up next to the altar now. It has the most wonderful array of designs here, some of them simple and some of them really complex. It's inspired by designs that you see in St Mark's in Venice and in Siena Cathedral, Florence and many other places in Italy. Although this particular floor isn't really very old, it was laid in 1910 by Mr. Pearson, and there's a similar one, but not as complex as this, in Truro Cathedral in Cornwall. I love coming to see this because every time I look, I find more designs that I want to make. We're going to start off looking at something relatively simple and then we'll move on to the more complex. So let's just look down here, and we can see that we've got a diamond shape here. The diamond has several diamonds within it. There are rectangles and then little triangles which are added to the edges and white um, ones in between and then the hole fits in as a diamond shape. You can see here too that we've got some little pretty little almost like flying geese triangles here. Uh, that's another idea for a good pattern and then we come on to the more simple four patch which is uh, nice for beginners. I want us to look at um, this design here, the simple square in a square, and that occurs in several tile designs. I use that design um, also from St Mark's in Venice to make a quilt, which I'm going to show you now. This is part of a bigger quilt, but you see I've used the square in a square design here and then the plain ones here. These colours actually are from St Mark's in Venice and so I've tried to get as close to those original colours as I could. It's great fun collecting the fabrics when you're making floor tile quilts. Another part of the design are the triangles here. And this inspired me for this part of the quilt where you see triangles here in rows. Once again, the colours are from St Mark's in Venice. We're going to look at some more complex designs now, which involve circles, which look like mariner's compasses. Really exciting. Come and have a look. This central design in front of the altar is really very complex, but beautiful. You'll note that there's a central circle here with very simple um, four-patch designs and then triangles going around the circle. And then there are mariner's compasses all the way round, and I've noticed that opposite ones are, sim are the same. So everything that's opposite 
is the same, but it could be in different colours. Really, really nice. And then the four corners have a more simple design on them. The Marinus Compass designs are similar to several in St. Mark's in Venice and other Italian cathedrals. And I'm going to show you the one that I made, which isn't quite the same as these, but inspired by them. I've laid my quilt out on the floor and I think it looks as though it could belong here. But my central design is quite different. But you'll notice that I've got nine designs in all, so you could call this a nine patch quilt with the central circle and then eight other designs around the edges. A design which caught my eye is in between the complex circles and the first um, geometric designs we started off with at the beginning. And this looks like Chinese lanterns. So I was thrilled to find this and I looked for colours that would really look like the same as the floor. And this is the quilt that I made. You can see the orange and the lemon and then the greys there and then the lines of black rectangles and red rectangles marching diagonally across the quilt in alternate lines. It's a very simple quilt to make and it's based on the diamond shape. Another thing I decided to do was to repeat the design in the quilting and the border. So I made a plastic template which I laid on the border and drew round it with a chalk pen so that would come off and then I quilted. So let's have a look at the quilting. You can see that I've got the same shape but I've just elongated it here and used it as a border design and then stipple quilted all around it so it echoes the design in the centre. We're in All Saints Church in the city centre of Bristol now and we're just looking at some really pretty tiles which are here. They're called encaustic tiles and they're etched with this design, probably put down in the Victorian times, so about 1850s. And there are some delightful patterns that you can copy here. One of the things when you're going into churches is you do ask permission to photograph. In some churches abroad it's not possible, so I take a sketchbook with me um, and I have this book which is just squared paper so that I can copy the designs. And I take some coloured pencils too, so that I can just um, fill the colours in. And uh, so this gives me inspiration for when I get home. An important part about doing this, if you're doing border designs, is to make sure that you actually copy the bit that goes round the corner. Because these corner areas are really quite difficult to work out if you haven't actually copied them. Obviously in this particular place, I didn't have my crayons, so I just wrote different colours in there. But um, by and large... I do take the pencils with me and it really helps. Another thing you can do is buy postcards. This is from St. Mark's in Venice. Sometimes the colours aren't very good. I find that if I buy um, books about the churches or the cathedrals, they very rarely have pictures of the tiles in. Usually it's stained glass window and Gothic arches. So just hunt around. Sometimes you can buy them. Otherwise, take a sketchbook. There are two particular block patterns that I want to focus on in here. Uh, one is uh, with quarter square triangles, a little white star design, and the other is the square within a square. Looks like flying geese, but the other way around. This is the larger block, and you'll see that it has four corner squares, which are dark, and then flying geese, and that is on all four sides, and then you've got a central square. I couldn't find fabric like that, so you'll see what I used instead. You can see the dark green corners and the flying geese element, and then this super fabric I had that I put in the centre square. This one here has got quarter square triangles in it, and it acts as the sashing block. You can see I used the same red, vibrant red, for the centre, and the little white stars I used a nice marbly fabric and then the black outlining the centre square. This wonderful gate is a super diamond pattern with black stripes and white diamonds in it and I thought this was a really good inspiration for making a quilt of diamonds. So now we're back in the sewing studio and we want to design the blocks so we're going to have to draft them from our resource material from the cathedral and All Saints Church and from the gate. 
So let's look and see how we do that. I'm standing at my cutting table, which is a nice height. It's actually two chests of drawers put together. And I have my um, rotary cutting board on top. But I also can do my drafting here. I've written a couple of books, and drafting is included in, in both of them. This is a book called Quilt Designs from Decorative Floor Tiles. And there's a nice section on drafting in it. I'm going to show you how I draft with graph paper and a pen, but there is an alternative, and that's a software program for the computer, and I'll show you that a little bit later. Shall we take the gate first? The gate is divided into diamonds, and there are two kinds of graph paper that we can use for drafting. One is squared paper, which is divided into quarter-inch segments, and then these are divided into squares of an inch. And the other kind of paper is isometric graph paper, for which you can use um, diamonds. I've got it in two sizes here. And you can get this at um, quilt shops. So if I want to draft a diamond, I use this ruler. It's flexible, but it's got very fine measurements in sixteenths on the edge. And I use a fine felt tip pen, which is a permanent marker. So just to demonstrate a small diamond. This one is marked in little triangles. I have to count how many. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Then I come down here, the same number. What do you think is about there? There we are. Down 15. So that's one possibility for a size of the diamond that I want to use. I designed this special diamond template to help with the cutting of this interesting shape. In All Saints Church, we found a little white star block and then a bigger block which had green squares in the corner, a little bit like a variable star with an inverted flying geese unit. So we're going to look at those, and also our antique quilt with the variable star. So this is the photograph that I took in All Saints Church, showing our two blocks. I'm going to draft this one first. We have to decide on the size of the block, and so I've divided it up and it comes into four sections. So we want to make it as a multiple of four, and I've decided on an eight inch block. I'm going to draw the square. You have to get this right first time because it's permanent ink, so you can't erase it. If I'm doing something very complicated, I use a pencil and I can actually erase it if I need to. The units come like this because we've got to make our squares for the corner. We need to refer to the photograph again now to look at the flying geese units and to work out which way they're going. The triangle tip of this unit comes to the outside of the block. So now I'm just going to draw those triangle points. So 
so that's our block design and now I want to look at the antique quilt because it's a very similar block and that's the one I want us to sew in our quilt. You'll see that the triangle points inwards here and we still have the four squares in the corner. And so here it is with the points inverted. And so we've drafted it out the way it's actually going to be sewn. But we need to know how big are the pieces for each unit. So I'm going to show you how I work that out. We've isolated three units for this block. The central square, which is here, the corner square, which we've put here, and then these flying geese units here, which are here. So we need to know how big to cut our pieces of fabric. So I'm going to use a red pen this time to add the seam allowance. And we always add a quarter of an inch. I can either follow the lines on the paper or use the measurement on the ruler. Both are accurate. So let's measure it. So we have a four inch square, one, two, three, four, and two quarter inch seam allowances. So we need to cut this piece four and a half inches square. I'll just write that in here. So we're going on to draw around the other shapes. And I'm going to show you the flying geese unit because it's slightly different. For the flying geese units, there are several methods to make them but we do need a basic rectangle. And I've added the quarter of an inch seam allowance. So this is two inches here, plus half an inch, and four inches this way, plus half an inch. So the rectangle is four and a half by two and a half. We could cut triangles to go here. We could cut squares to go on here. And I shall demonstrate that method on the sewing machine. And then there's a further method by using a special flying geese template, which I shall show you, which is the easiest of all. We had our little white star block too that we were drafting, and I've drawn it out here to show you. And I decided for the quilt that we'd actually make a little amendment to it to make it more fun, because I want to include half square triangles. So I've added those to the corner. Let's take a look. So here's the little star block, and I've drawn lines across the corners so we can actually learn to piece a half square triangle. Once again I've worked out the elements that we need. We need a center square which is three and a half inches. We need four quarter square triangles here. and I've drawn the piece here and then we're going to do four half square triangles which are here. But there's something you must remember. When you're cutting half square triangles you need to cut it the finished size plus seven eighths of an inch. And similarly with quarter square triangles, you cut your pieces the finished size plus one and a quarter inches. Now, let's go and look at the computer and see what the software does. The software program I use is Electric Quilt 5. It's very easy to use and there are other programs on the market. There's Pro Quilt too. So I'm going to show you how to draw a block and how to colour it. I need to choose the size of my block and I can do that just here. We want it 8 inches by 8 inches. Just press OK and here it is. And I can start drawing. This is exactly as I did before but just on the computer. And then I save that in my sketchbook and I can colour them in as well if I want to. I can do it with fabric. Maybe 
could choose a, a light blue one for the outside. So that's what's fun to do and you can print those out, you can save them in your sketchbook and we're going to go and look in my sketchbook and see what else I've done in here because I've tried to design some blocks for our quilt and colour them in so you can see some of the ones I've chosen. And we want to go and look for fabric with these sorts of colours. I think actually what I'd like to do is to look at the quilt here. And these are the sorts of colours that I really want to buy. I think that's going to make a nice fun quilt. We're very lucky to have lots of quilt shops around. People also buy fabric on the internet, but nothing beats going into a quilt shop and handling the fabric yourself and seeing exactly what it's like and choosing other bolts to go with it. We're going to go to Stitch in Time in Kew to see what we can find there. Chris. Hi Chris, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. I've come to buy some fabric. Oh great, today. lovely. So I'll just put this away yeah. and then we can um, yeah. see what you're doing. And have a nice look round. Yes. It all looks lovely as Thank usual. You. Thank window you. window looks fabulous. So here we are in Stitch in Time Quilt Shop and um, I'm going to look in, uh, at the fabric but I'm going to show you how it's presented on the shelves. A lot of quilt shop owners do this where they ha have a quilt uh, that is made from some of the fabrics around because it actually helps to sell the fabrics um, and collections can then come in. Um, how, how often do you buy more fabric? Virtually every week. Mm. Um, fabric is coming in the, the entire time. There's a regular delivery every month mm. and, and usually every week. Yeah. Um, the important thing is when you come to choose your fabric make sure that you buy enough for your quilt because it may not be here next time you visit. That's right, and that, that's what's exciting about coming here because there's such variety and uh, never the same thing twice. So yes, really hopefully. Nice. Yes. hopefully. <laughs> so now I'd like to look around the shop and see how it's presented and so that we can choose some fabric and show how to actually choose your fabric when you want to make your quilt. One of the most important things about making a quilt is that you want to have plenty of contrast. So if I chose this fabric, for example, as what I would call my focus fabric because it's got lots of colours in it. Um, I want to choose some dark, some medium values and then some lighter values to go with it because the contrast really makes the quilt. So if we just look for a few things here, just around here, this is an autumnal um, fabric. So we want to have some greens and browns and oranges and, and the gold in it. So I would actually um, put this on the counter and I'm going to choose this as a light colour and put it next to it. And I'd also like some green. I see also that there's a nice sort of maroon colour here and I'm going to choose this. I'm not quite sure whether it's the right colour but I'm, I'm just going to see. I think it is. It really picks up the colour that leaves go in, in the autumn. So we're going to put that here and I'm going to look for this gold colour. And I think that this might be just the thing. So I'm going to put it back with all these. And I see now looking at this that I've got two lights, two darks, and we could call this a sort of medium. So I think I actually need one more fabric which is going to bring out the medium tones and not be too dark and not be too light. And so I'm going to look for a sort of gingery colour to be my medium value in the fabric. I think this one will do because it brings out all the, the gold and a bit of the yellow too. So I think this um, colour will be very good because it picks up the, the yellow and, and several tones of the brown and the orangey colours in there. There's just one more I want to look for now and that's a sort of paler green which I think I need to pick up the green that's in my focus fabric. I think I've found just the right one here. 
so I'm going to put it back on the table. I think that looks really nice. A good tip when choosing fabric, and you're really not quite sure which colours go with it, once you've got your main fabric, your focus fabric, you'll find that there's some registration um, colour marks along the selvage. And you'll find that all these little um, colours that are used in the printing will be on the selvage. And, and it's a pretty good guide, so you can actually choose fabrics which um, match these colours. Then you'll know that your quilt will coordinate nicely. Now, I, I have done that. Uh, I haven't chosen all of them, but there are enough here to make a really nice quilt. So that's a really nice hint for when you're buying fabric to make sure that you do get the colours right. We're going to look around the shop now and see how the fabrics are displayed. Most shops have fabrics displayed in blocks of colour. This is very nicely displayed here, so you can see mauves and yellows, blues and greens, and that, that actually helps you to choose the colour. But if you're a little bit worried about that, there are also kits available in most shops, and we've got some here on, on the table. It does make life much easier if it's all put together for you, uh, if you don't have a lot of confidence in colour. This particular uh, range of fabrics is from the Civil War era, and it's very popular, people like making antique quilts whereas um, these are from the 30s. Uh, in fact, I, I bought this pack the other day because I really loved it. Nice and pretty, pretty. And here, this is a country look down here. And you may want to add other fabrics to it, but your basic um, fabrics have been chosen for you. And here's some more little um, buses and car oh, cars and buses. So that does help, and a lot of shops do that for you. But I find it more exciting to actually choose the colours myself. And I go for, usually for bright colours, and that's what we're going to do now. This is my favourite corner in this shop because I love all the bright fabrics. And um, I'm going to choose something uh, that catches my eye and choose some fabrics to go with it. I want about eight other fabrics to make my quilt. And looking at all these really bright ones, I just love this with the little shoes on it. I'm going to take this out and have a look. So this is the fabric that I've chosen and without looking at the registration marks we're actually going to um, choose all the other fabrics, the eight fabrics, to go with it. See what we can find. So I'm going to hold this in my hand and I can see there's quite a few greens and yellows in here. And there's a nice green on here. That looks good. I like that. I'd like something a little bit paler, actually. Ooh, there's a nice yellow with green spots here. There are some shoes um, which are yellow and green. They're, they're yellow with white spots but green inside, so I think that'll match up with that. I'd quite like to go for red as well. Let's see if we can find some red which would be nice. Because the pattern is quite um, uh, dominant, I'm going to look for something with a smaller pattern. Um, I don't want it to, to dominate the, the focus fabric. And I quite like these um, bees here. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, that's nice because these shoes here have yellow around them and a bit of grey, and these little bees have yellow and a bit of grey. Still holding my uh, focus fabric, I'm going to look for a purpley colour here. This colour. I quite like to hold the bolts up against the other ones in the shelf. And actually, I quite like this one that's on top. I need some dark fabric, and that, that will pick that one out nicely. Now, I want something also a little bit lighter in the purple range. Maybe this will do. Yes, I like that. There's turquoise on those little shoes and the turquoise is here and then we've still got the purple which we're picking up and that goes with that. So I'm going to put those two on the table. Now we're going to see what, what we're missing. Um, I think I want another green, and I'm also going to look for a pink. I think 
think this is a lighter green than the first one that I chose. And uh, that goes nicely with this little pair of shoes here. And then I'm going to look for something to go with these shoes, because I haven't got much blue. There's some dark and light. So I'll see if I can find some dark. Oh, I found just the right thing here. Look at that. This gives me another dark fabric to play with. And it goes really nicely with these little um, spotted shoes here. I can see that somewhere else in the shop, there's some uh, pink and there's some blue that I'm going to um, join in with these colours and I'm going to put them all on the table and we can have a look and also look at the designs that I brought with me from drafting them in the sewing studio to see whether there would be parts of the fabric that would be really good for my quilt. So here are the fabrics that I've chosen and in fact I chose nine extra ones rather than eight because I couldn't resist them and we're just going to have a look at them now and see that I chose two darks and three mediums and two, three light and then a medium light here. So this is pretty good because this will give me the different values that I need for making the quilt. Another thing that I didn't do but we're going to have a look at now is look at the registration marks on the fabric and see how I got on. So you can see if you look along here that I pretty well chose some, not all of them, and if I wanted to add, I could actually add an orange and a dark green. But I think I've got enough here for what I want to do. I'm going to get my designs out now to see whether they're going to work with this fabric, but I'm sure that they will. Well, you may remember that we drafted these designs back at the studio, and I'm going to um, remind you of this one with the flying geese and the big square in the middle. And this one, well I've enlarged this because I want to um, just add some lines on it to show um, half square triangles. So I'm just going to get rid of this one. And this is the third block that we drafted as well. Here's that block and it now has lines in here for half square triangles. And we're going to have a central square which is here the corner half square triangles and then these quarter square triangles which turn up here. A really good idea is to bring along um, square rulers if you have square um, places in your quilt in the design uh, so that you can actually place the squares on top of the fabric and do what's called fussy cutting so you get exactly what you want in the middle of the square and I'm just going to show you that now. You know that the, the square that we want to do is actually uh, to scale, so that's three and a half inches cut. So I'm going to place it on a pair of shoes here, these little um, turquoise shoes. So I know that I could actually place the square on there and cut round it to know that, that those shoes are going to be exactly in the middle of the block. Um, and this is called fussy cutting. And similarly, with the larger design, I need a four and a half inch um, ruler and this fits absolutely here. So now I can place it on the fabric and find some shoes that I can have in the middle. As this is bigger I can actually get more shoes in, in in one space but it's quite a good idea to have a central pair of shoes when you're doing this. Well I'm really thrilled with what I've chosen. Chris would you like to come and have a look and see what you think? It's always nice to have the opinion of the shop owner and uh, I think that looks great. That's really nice. Yeah. I know when I saw this fabric I had to buy it, so I'm really yeah. glad that you that you liked it. And um, you don't mind if customers bring uh, the bolts out onto the table to have Not a look. at all. I think you absolutely have to do this. Mm. You know, don't be afraid ever of pulling out bolts and trying them together. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's going to look great. I look forward to seeing the finished quilt. Well, I should bring it, so I think now we have to get cutting. OK, okay. let's get cutting. <laughs> Thank you. <All> right. <laughs> well, that was fun, wasn't it, going shopping? Now we've got the fabric, we're going to make the blocks. And we're going to start off with the variable star, which is this one. I've decided that we need a piece of the shoe fabric in the middle. And I'm going to fussy cut this. I'm using this board which revolves, which makes it very easy when you're cutting around a square. We need a four and a half inch square. And I'm finding this pair of shoes, which I think will be rather nice for the middle. So I'm placing the four and a half inch ruler on it. And as far as possible, I'm trying to keep with the straight of the grain. 
Just put my finger on the edge just to stabilise it. And now I can just move the ruler around. I'm going to lay my central square on my drafted paper and we're going to start doing the flying geese now. There are several methods of making flying geese and I'm going to show you two. The first method is to cut four and a half by two and a half inch rectangles and two and a half inch squares and so we're going to draw a line down the diagonal of each pink square and then I'm going to go to the sewing machine and sew down that line. You can secure it with pins but this is such a small seam that it would be easy to do without pins. I'm checking my sewing machine to make sure I've got a 2.5 um, stitch, that's the size I like, and then I'm just going to sew along the line. I can just use the scissors to cut. I've sewn my line and we're going to have a look at it and I'm going to press it back to the corner to make sure it fits, that's fine, and then I'm just going to cut off about a quarter of an inch. And press it back. I'm now taking a second flying goose unit square, putting it on here, and now I'm just going to go and sew it along the line as I did last time. I've sewn along the line here, pressing it back and now I'm just going to cut off the waist as I did before. And there is one flying geese unit which should have a quarter of an inch at the top and we did cut accurately. It's just a bare quarter of an inch but I'm going to show you another method of making flying geese units which I think is much more accurate. This particular method requires a template and as with any other items that I've used in making this DVD there'll be a list of suppliers available at the end. You need to cut two squares. You have a background square which is larger than the geese square and the measurements are given on here. And what I need to do is draw a diagonal line, making sure it's placed absolutely square in here. The good thing about this method is that you only do four lines of sewing and you have four flying geese which are all accurate. I'm just going to sew a quarter of an inch either side of this line. So I've sewn a quarter of an inch either side of the line and with my ruler I'm just going to cut down the centre. So I end up with two pieces like this. I'm now going to press them so that the spare bit of fabric is pressed towards the background. And now all I need to do is to put one on top of the other and match the corners. And I'm just going to draw my last diagonal line. From corner to corner. I use a pencil for this because in fact you're going to be cutting on this line so it doesn't really matter about it marking. And then I'm going back to the sewing machine and I'm going to sew a quarter of an inch either side of that line. So I've stitched a quarter of an inch either side of that line and I'm now just going to cut it in half and I end up with two units like this. 
Now all I need to do is make a little snip here and here and then I'm going to press them from this side so that they both lie flat like that. They're pressed now and you can see where I just snipped the fabric to the line there. And now I'm going to turn them over and cut my four flying geese units with the template. The template has a back with a line in it and the front. And I'm just going to match this triangle to the triangle of the flying geese here. And then all I do And there we have an accurate flying geese unit and we can measure with our quarter inch and we have an exact quarter inch seam allowance here. These flying geese templates come in four different sizes which are very handy for using in a variety of different size blocks. All our units are made now so I'm going to lay them on the drafted piece of paper and in that way I know they're all going to be in exactly the right position and I shall carry this piece of paper to the sewing machine with the um, units all in the right place so I know when I sew them together I'm not going to go wrong. So let's have a look. We have our central square with the little shoes in it. We have the flying geese units here. We're going to end up with pink stars. And then we have little two and a half inch squares of the turquoise with the purple dot. One of the reasons I lay the fabric out on the paper is that it's so easy to do this and not notice. But once you see it on the paper, you can, it screams out that it should actually be the other way around. And when I'm teaching this method, I find it easier to do this because uh, there's always somebody who gets it wrong if they don't lay it down on the piece of paper. So this works for me. Okay, so the first block's done and now we're going to move on to block two. We need to make five of these and there are three elements to this particular block. There's a half square triangle here, two little flying geese here and then a square within a square. I'm going to start off by showing you how to make the half square triangles. We know that the finished unit size is 3 inches, so we're going to add 7 eighths of an inch to that and we know how big to cut our pieces. We need two squares for each corner, 3 and 7 eighths of an inch square. So I've chosen blue and yellow. I'm going to put the lighter one on top of the dark one and I've drawn a line down the diagonal and I'm going to machine a quarter of an inch either side of that line and then I'm going to cut along that diagonal line and I shall end up with two pieces like this. Part them and press. I always press towards the dark fabric and you'll end up with two half square triangles. So we just need to make another pair and then we have four half square triangles for the corners of this block. Now we're going to go on to the centre part. I've got a three and a half inch square which I need and I'm going to choose these little pretty little shoes with stars on and I think that's more or less central. I'm going with the grain, straight grain of the fabric again and I'm just going to cut around the square. So now we have our little fussy cut square and I need some two inch squares to go all the way around. I'm going to cut them two inches and put a diagonal line here and I'm just going to sew opposite corners. I'm going to sew down that line and then flip back. to 
just like this. I shall take it to the ironing board and press and then I can cut away the waste here. And now all that remains for me to do is to put the final two inch squares on the opposite corners and I'm going to sew down there and then flip it back and I shall have my central square. So it's basically complete now, here it is, and all that remains is to cut off the waste from the back, the back of the triangles, which I shall do now. So I'm going to lay it here. Oh, that's very pretty. I'm going to lay it now as we did with the last block so I can take it to the sewing machine to sew. We have our four half square triangles. And the little units that go in here are flying geese units. These are three by one and a half. And as you saw me making flying geese before, I won't do it again, but just put in the units that I made to go in there. So that makes a really bright block. And now we're ready to go on to make the last block. So let's see what's going to happen there. I've chosen some really funky colours for this. We need another little three and a half inch square. And I've got a little pair of stripy shoes in the middle here. And then we're going to make the quarter square triangles. And to do this, we have to cut some squares. We need two of one colour and one of each of two colours. And these squares are four and a quarter inches square. If you remember, we said for quarter square triangles, it was the finished size, which is three inches, plus one and a quarter. So it's four and a quarter. I'm now going to lay these on top right sides together and I'm going to go and sew a quarter of an inch either side of these lines. I've done that and now I'm going to cut down the middle of both of them on that diagonal line. Just cutting down the middle on one And then on the other one. So I've ended up with two like that and two like this. I'm now going to press them towards my main fabric, which is the turquoise. I can just finger press them here. I'm going to put them on top of each other and make sure that the corners match. I'm going to draw a white diagonal line through the middle and I'm going to machine a quarter of an inch either side of that line, cut them apart and hey presto, I've got four quarter square triangles. So here we are, that's all sewn. I use um, either a grey or a beige thread to um, work in with the fabric and I find that those two colours work in with most so that you don't get any show over on the other side. So here we are, we've got our two bits here and this is what you get. One, two. Three, four, here are the other two. So that was out of those four squares of fabric. Now I'm going to place them on my paper where I drafted the design but first I'm going to snip off the little triangles at the corners because we don't want them. With sharp scissors I shall cut off all the points, all the triangles that are left behind. Now I'm going to do that on all of them and I can lay them on my paper. Make sure they're all in the right place, check that it looks nice and you're ready to sew block one. 
block two and block three. We've got all the hard work done now, all we have to do is sew them together. And I'm going to show you my method of doing it, where in theory you can't go wrong. I've got the block laid out, I'm picking up the two first pieces and putting them right sides together. I don't need to pin because they're accurately pieced. And I'm just going to sew down the line with a quarter of an inch seam allowance. I'm not removing it from the sewing machine, but I'm just going to add the next piece. If you've sewn it accurately, these should be exact as they are here. And I take the last two pieces in these two rows. I'm not cutting the thread. I'm joining these on. This is called chain piecing. Now I do need to cut the thread. This looks like this now and all I need to do is add on the right hand column. checking all the time that I go that I've got these the right way. Now the last corner square of the block. what kind of blocks you've got. This method works for all of them, sewing them together. It's fail safe now. I'm going to hold up what we've got so far and then we just need to do the two horizontal lines. So you can see they're all joined together in the right order. You'll find that these here want to be pressed to the outside. You can just finger press, I just do it with a fingernail. These will want to be pressed towards the centre. And then I'm going to arrange them so that these bits just butt up to each other. And here I put a pin in. I like these flat headed pins. Just put the pin in the back and make sure it matches exactly at the end. The same down here so that those two seams butt up. Use another pin and one at the end. I want to make sure that that middle point is in the right place and it is. Just put a little pin in here and then I'm just going to sew down here, taking the pins out before I sew over them. If you sew over pins it tends to break the needle. And it's not good for the sewing machine. You will see I've got a quarter inch foot on this sewing machine. Almost every make has its own quarter inch foot and this is what we need for making quilts.
Now you can see how neat the seams are and we're going to repeat that with the last horizontal seam. So once again you're just going to check that these two seams butt up to each other and put a pin in. And here too. That way you make nice clean seams. So quickly done here. Once again, removing the pins as I go. Now all that remains for me to do is just snip off some little points here so that it makes pressing easier and then when you start quilting there aren't lumps and bumps where the seams all join each other. I do this on all my seams and it makes the pieces lie much flatter. And now I'm going to press. Some people like to press the seams open. That's fine too. Just remember there aren't any quilt police. You can do what you like. Whatever suits you, you do that. nice flat block. We need four blocks like this for the corner squares and we're going to make the other blocks for the center and then we're going to put them all on the design wall and join them up. Well we've finished our quilt and I think it looks really fun. We had the four variable star blocks in the corners. I made them all different and then for block two which is this one we made four of those here with little shoes in the middle and block three I made five with more shoes and then I put them together with a pink sashing strip and then four little cornerstones these are called in blue which I also have put in the sashing here just to frame the quilt and then I put on this really fun border of all the shoes eight inches wide here there will be cutting instructions inserted in the DVD and then this is going to be the binding and I just put it up here to give me um, some idea of how it's going to look. So I think that we've had fun making this and I think that this quilt will look really nice on a bed for a young girl or on the wall. To know how to construct a quilt I made a DVD called Let's Get Started and you'll find all the information you need included in this. It deals with rosary cutting, machine piecing and completing your quilt. This is the quilt that was inspired by the kimonos. You can see the T-shapes of the block making positive and negative shapes. This is a tessellation quilt. So you can see that this is made up from some dragon fabric and gives a good positive statement. This is another version of the T-block and you can see that I started off in the centre with a pale pink colour going to darker pink and maroon towards the outside. And similarly, I've gone from very pale blue on the outside into turquoise and dark turquoise in the middle. This very colourful diamond quilt was inspired by the black and white gate that we saw when we were on our trip, going round looking for sources of inspiration. The fabric is called Wings of Desire by the Woodrow Studio. The quilt was made by Sally Ablett. I like the detail of rickrack across the diamonds. 
This is another version of the diamond quilt. And this time I've used lots of different uh, fruit and vegetable fabrics which I was collecting. It's a good idea to make a theme of fabrics and collect all of one kind. This one's very colourful and it is also divided by some rickrack. The children love this because they can look for various fruits and find out how many diamonds of bananas or strawberries or peas are on the quilt. Looking at the detail you can see how well the different fruits and vegetables are printed on there. So we have lemons, plums, tomatoes and mushrooms. This quilt is called Saturday Market and was quilted by Rosemary Archer. Once again on the diamond theme, but this quilt is made with strip piecing and using a 60 degree angle on your ruler to find the diamond shape. It's pieced very easily and is also inspired by um, part of the floor in St. Mark's in Venice. The zigzag design really looks three-dimensional. This small quilt was inspired by the autumnal leaves falling off the Virginia creeper on a wall at home. Once I'd made it, it inspired me to use the theme further of the seasons and make spring, summer and winter. This is the spring version of the quilt with dark, medium and light fabrics bringing out positive and negative spaces of the motif. You can see I used a focus fabric of pansies all around the border to give the illusion of spring. This vibrant version of this tessellation is called summer and I've appliqued some really vivid tropical flowers all around the edges and I've used those flowers as my focus fabric and chosen all the hot colours to go into the middle with a nice green border. We'll look at the detail of the applique and you can see that I have zigzagged around the edge a very small satin stitch of the flowers and then I've just done some stitching on the petals. This just adds something extra to this quilt. So this is winter in the same design with many grey, white and black fabrics. The diagonal lines I've machine stitched on there with sparkly thread and then put snowflakes all around. The binding is quite fun because it's a barber pole effect whereas I've cut striped black and white fabric on the bias to add an extra zinger to this quilt. This is the quilt that was inspired by All Saints Floor. We looked at two different blocks, the green square block with the dark green squares in the corner and the black and pale green flying geese units and then the star block with the white star points which are made up from quarter square triangles. The sashing in between helps to delineate the blocks and the border is made up of little square in a square squares in fact although they're on point. I've tried to match the fabrics as closely as I could to the mosaics in the floor. This is a contemporary version. You'll note now that the small block which formerly had white star points now has royal blue star points and a wiggly blue and yellow square in the middle. The block which had green corners now has blue and yellow corners and the flying geese units are made up of yellow and blue spot and a dark royal navy blue. I've set these blocks on point and they look quite different from the first quilt. Once again I've used a binding of yellow and blue stripes which I cut on the bias because I like that effect. This quilt reminds me of sunshine. I'm showing this quilt because I've used the little star block all around the outside border and I've used different colours of green, pink and cream to make each block different so it shows what could be done with a very simple block and quarter square triangles. The central part of the quilt was designed by Harriet Hargrave and I took a class from her and made that part. You'll notice that there are flying geese on the inner border flying all the way around the central Le Moyne star. This quilt is going to be much bigger than this and I'm really excited about making it. This is an antique quilt I bought in the United States on a recent visit there. I love this quilt. It was made in 1880 
and is machine pieced and machine quilted, which is very unusual. So it must have been one of the first ones that was machine quilted. It's in, quilted in diagonal lines. I love the central yellow block. It just is one of that colour, but really makes it stand out. The fabric also used for the other blocks, although is directional, hasn't always been put in the same direction. So you have vertical lines and horizontal lines. The variable star block at the corners is larger than the ones in the middle. And there's that pretty little border with the squares on point, making them look like diamonds. This is a lovely quilt and has inspired me to make many others using that block. This quilt was inspired by the antique quilt with the variable star block and I've made a little patriotic crib quilt. You can see that I've used red, white and blue for the blocks and I've interspersed them with hearts which I've appliqued on. The quilt is currently being made so I haven't quilted it yet. The flying geese design around the top left and the bottom right corner echo the flying geese units in the variable star blocks. This is an on-point version of the variable star block. There are 16 blocks in here, but the way that I've used the colours and the values of light, medium and dark, I have actually hidden the design so that you wouldn't know it was the variable star block. So we have strong lines of dark maroon and dark green, and then they're all on point in their square with a pretty pink and pale green border. Let's put some lines on here so I can show you exactly where the blocks are. This is the quilt that I made to represent the floor in Bristol Cathedral which runs down by the choir stalls. I love the zigzag design and although the tiles were laid just about over a hundred years ago, this design looks really contemporary. The zigzag is reflected in the outside right-hand border and then in the central area is in pink and black with the square within the square blocks marching down the centre. This is the contemporary version of the zigzag quilt. This time I've taken the zigzag as the main feature and made two columns going from the top to the bottom. And I made it out of plaids and stripes and old bits of shirt to make a sort of folksy look. The applique adds to this. This design was taken from a section in Bristol Cathedral by the altar. It reminds me of Chinese lanterns. I've actually made it out of diamonds and applique the red and black rectangles where the diamonds intersect. Before I did that, for the grouting, couched over some thick black thread in all the diagonal lines and then applique the red and black rectangles on top. This quilt called Gathering the Grapes is a contemporary version of the Chinese lantern quilt from Bristol Cathedral. I was teaching in a quilt shop in Miami and I saw the grape fabric and I just loved it, fell in love with it and had to buy all the other fabrics to match it. I then applique purple and yellow grapes on the diagonals for the little rectangles that previously had been in black and red. This is a really fun quilt and is nice to hang in the kitchen. I made this quilt to celebrate floors in Venice. The central circle is looking really quite three-dimensional, although it's actually flat. And the boxes around the outside give examples of different kinds of tiles that you see on the floors. We've seen some of these in Bristol Cathedral the bottom left corner has the square in a square and the middle left hand side section has tumbling blocks that we saw in the antique piece of quilt that I held up when we were looking at inspiration. These tumbling blocks are three dimensional. You feel as though you're looking down into them because of the little black diamond in the middle. I've appliqued a motif in each of the four corners and also in the corners around the central circle. This final quilt in our gallery was made recently and inspired by irises. I was offered a challenge to 
make a quilt inspired by a photograph. And this is what I made. I've appliqued the different Irish shapes onto the pieced squared background, interspersed with a black and white striped frame. And I've laid some of the iris leaves on the top of the frame and some behind. The border gives an attic window look to it by having two dark sides and two light sides. So if you look at flowers, you can be inspired just to use the colours with traditional blocks or to do something like I have here and try to make the irises look as realistic as possible. Well, we've come to the end of our journey from fabric to quilt. I hope you enjoyed it. I thought it was fun showing you the way I work and what inspires me and the way I choose my fabric and make my quilts. As I mentioned earlier, I travel a lot, I'm on the road a lot, so who knows? We may meet up fairly soon, either in a class or at a quilt show. I hope so. Bye-bye. <laughs>